everybody. Yeah, it's good to see y'all this morning. Man, we want to welcome our online guests this morning as well. And also, man, we got a lot of black shirts in this room. What's up, y'all? We had a... Uh... We had our student ministry rooted weekend this weekend, and man, it was such an incredible uh, experience to be a part of it one night and just seeing all of the students here. I mean, I just want you guys to give it up for Pastor Charles Bobo. He is an incredible, incredible youth pastor. Um, I've been I've been around a lot of I've been around a lot of youth ministries as a youth pastor. You know, I've ran some of them, um, and I've been around a lot of good and bad, and, and seen it done well, and seen it done poorly. And we are blessed, blessed, blessed to have Charles lead our students. And uh, man, just what a powerful ministry that is, and weekend, and how important it is to uh, the lives of our students. So uh, today, though, we want to we want to continue our series on how to and looking at how to work and how to rest, because I think this is one of the areas in our lives that we often get a little mixed up in. We kind of swing a pendulum either one way or swing it another way, and we do too much of one thing or too much of the other thing, the opposite thing. But what does it really mean to work and rest and how to do that and how to find balance in both of those things? Um, but I kind of want to just open up with just a really honest question with y'all. How many of us are just exhausted? How many of us are just tired, right? I mean, I know I am uh, just this past week in, like I said, the Holy Spirit is, is absolutely funny. Whenever you write a message, it's like, that's what happens that week kind of stuff, you know? And so the past three weeks, we've had this stomach bug just rolling through our house. And uh, if you're a parent of a kid, you will, you will sympathize deeply with me on this. But we had uh, one kid at a time sick. So you have a sick kid for three days, then another kid sick for three days, then another kid sick, and, and, and we have six. And so, man, if we would have stopped at two, it would have been good. But I don't know what we were thinking. We took that, that burden on ourselves. But, man, we've just been dealing with the stomach bug. I got it Friday or Thursday night, too. Um, and so just literally hours after I finished writing this, boom, I went down with it. And then on top of that, we've gotten... Uh, just message after message from home about, you know, this person's sick or this person's struggling or this person um, is trying to find a new job because they're, they're stuck in where they're at. And, and then you throw that on top of the world, right? I mean, I don't know if you still watch the news. I, I try not to because it's like watching a sad movie. I don't like watching movies to cry. I want to I wanna be happy and laugh at stuff. Um, but the news is just terrible. I mean, just the things going on in our world, it just seems heavy, right? Burdensome. And then now we're, we're working and we're taking our kids to soccer practice. And no wonder we're all raising our hands that we're exhausted because this world is a world that's gone mad. It seems like every turn seems like there's something else, right? Just something to continue to pile on. And as soon as we get one thing moved off our plate, boom, here comes five more things just dumped on it. And it seems that it's never ending. And then you have technology thrown in here too, right? Something that was quoted to make our life easier, right? It's supposed to give us more margin, more time to, to go on walks and to go to the beach and to spend time with our loved ones. Yet it seems like when we're doing those things, we have this, this thing in our phone, on our pocket going over and over again, trying to tie us back to the world that we've tried to escape from. And it's just made us operate at a speed of a supercomputer. And I don't think we were made to operate at the speed of a supercomputer. And it just seems like there's constantly something going on, something stealing our attention, something stealing our time away. And man, we're just exhausted. I feel like I wake up every day at six and seven, by nine o'clock, I'm ready for bed again. Can anybody relate? You're like, okay, is it nap time? Let's do this thing. Um, but man, it just seems like thing after thing after thing after thing. And I don't think that this is how God intended us to live. I don't think the pace that we're constantly running at is the pace that God made us to run at. See, when, when he made us in the garden, he put us, he put us in there to work. He put us in there to take care of things. But he also put us in there to enjoy him. Right, Adam and Eve would take these strolls through the garden with God in the cool of the evening, and they would enjoy his company, enjoy his presence. They would, they would find rest in God daily from that. And I think that 
that is how God intends us to operate too. It's not that when we look at this balance of work and rest, that work is just not important and that we shouldn't just work. God calls us to work, and we're going to take a look at that in a moment, but equally, God calls us to balance that out with rest. And a great picture of this balance between rest and work and how the right perspective of both of these things is important is in, found in Luke chapter 10. So if you got your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn there, and let's just dive right into it. Luke chapter 10, it's the story of, of Martha and Mary, and I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with this story, right? These are good friends of Jesus. So this is a close family to Jesus, their brother is Lazarus, the guy that Jesus wept over, the guy that Jesus rose from the dead. This is Mary who is at the tomb, right? These are people that are close to Jesus. And so Jesus approaches their home and Mary or Martha invites Jesus in and that's where we pick up in the story. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And I love this story because it is just a really beautiful depiction of biblical work and rest and what it means to work in the right manner, what it means to not work in the right manner, what it means to rest in the wrong manner, and what it means to rest in the right manner too. And often we, we live in a culture where we pit these things at odds with one another, right? Right? Like work and rest are like these counterparts just butting heads all the time in our lives. And they, it's like they're stealing joy from each other. It's, we're, we're so busy at work that when we get home and we want to just take a nap, but man, we feel guilty for it. Can anybody relate to that? Or we feel guilty for sitting down for five minutes, for resting, for taking a nap, for just not thinking about something for five minutes, right? We feel guilty for resting, but then also like, our, our rest is stolen by just this constant thought of work. And, and if we don't rest, then all of a sudden we're, we're just exhausted at work and we can't perform at the level that we need to perform at. We can't think clearly the way that we need to think. And so these things are just at odds with one another. And really the way that God designed us to operate and designed our lives to be is to be in this balance between work and rest. And he lays this out very clearly for us in the scriptures. And when we look at, at what it means to specifically work, we see Martha here. We see Martha who's been given this gift of hospitality. And so what she's doing is honoring to Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing, right? She's welcoming people into her home. She's using the gifts that God has given her. And so she's caring for the people who've come into their house. She's preparing food, water, whatever it may be, making sure they're comfortable. Is your seat, are you comfortable enough? Can I get you anything? Can I kick up the lazy boy for you a little bit? Is, it, is the AC okay in here? I know it's, it's kind of hot outside, but we can kick it down to 68 if you want, right? She's, she's doing something that's really God-honoring. But we see that, that she, the problem with Martha enters not because of the work that she's doing, but because of the heart that she takes on while she's doing it. See, she goes from having a joyful heart of serving Jesus to seeing her sister sit at Jesus' feet, just listening, apparently doing nothing, and her heart shifts from joy to bitterness, a, a heart of pride even, that my work my, the things that I'm doing, Mary, hello, look at me. The things I'm doing are so important. What are you doing sitting there, sitting at Jesus' feet? Come on, girl, get up, let's do this. We got work to do, right? And see, work isn't the wrong action. And we know that we were created for work because it says so in the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, 15 says, the Lord God took man, put him in the garden, to work it and to keep it. See, God did design us to work. He designed us to take care of things, right? He designed us to take care of the garden that he placed us in. 
But what happened for Martha is quickly her work became an idol. It became her identity. It became her sole purpose. And it became something to be worshipped even. Martha, with the posture of her heart, is worshipping the work she's doing. And the problem with that is that in reality, the one who dictates her identity, the one who dictates her purpose, and the one who is deserving of her worship is sitting in the room and she's missing it because she's so consumed with what she's doing and she missed it. And see, work is one of those things that when we have too much of a good thing, it's bad for us. And this makes me think of Oreos. Um, I love Oreos. My goodness, I love them deep fried. I love them just the chocolate. I love them with the cream. I love the double stuff when you get the double love right in between there. Man, Oreos are my, my, my love language, I will be honest. So, um, but I can easily sit on the couch and pound not one sleeve, but a family size box really easily. And while they are good for my spirit and my soul, they are expediting what a slowing metabolism is already beginning to do. And so I have to be careful with them. I can't have too much of them. I can't be consumed by them. I can't worship them, think about them all the time, right? That's not a, that's not a healthy lifestyle. And work can be similar to that. That it can, it's a good thing. It's, it's something that God has given us as something to do as a, as a purpose, as a meaning to our life. But when we're so focused on that one thing and we're consumed by it, and we have too much of it, it can indeed quickly turn into several sleeves of Oreos. And the Lord, Jesus, is sitting here with Martha and he, and he confronts her on this. And, and look at Jesus' tone here. He answers her and he says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. This isn't Jesus saying, hey, what are you doing? Duh, your sister's sitting here. You should be doing this too. What are you doing? His, his heart here, his, his speech is, is one of compassion for her. It's gentleness to a friend. He says, Martha, you're anxious about so many things. And I think Jesus likewise looks at us all the time too when we're consumed by work. I mean, how many times do we sit at home and just sit there and answer emails? Or we need to have, you know, answer this work text. My goodness, if I don't do this thing right now, the whole world's gonna collapse, right? We feel that pressure, even in our homes, even after five o'clock hits, we've driven home, we've had dinner, we're sitting on our couch. My goodness, I gotta continue to work. Even at the expense of our family, I mean, as a dad, I don't know how many times that I'm sitting there with my kids and God bless them, they, they call it out. Dad, could you just put your phone down for a second? Pooh, man, that's a gut punch. And you're right. I'm consumed with work. I'm consumed with doing what I need to do every day. And, and, if, and if, I don't, if I don't answer this one thing, my goodness, everything will just fall apart. And Jesus looks at us and says, why are you like that? Why are you so anxious about everything? Why are you so worried about things? And the other thing that we see in the story that work did to Martha, not only did it make, make her anxious and consumed by it, but it also turned her heart into one of jealousy and, and bitterness and we see in Philippians chapter 2, 14 through 15, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, work when it consumes us can easily give us a, a heart of bitterness of pride, it's easy to go to work and, and complain and grumble. Why? Well, number one, because we're exhausted, because we've been up all night thinking about it. But number two, I think also, it, we feel that our work becomes the most important thing in the world. See, Martha starts to look at her sister with disdain. 
She starts to be frustrated with Mary because she believes what she is doing, Martha that is, what Martha is doing is vastly more important than what Mary is doing. And we often assume that our life's like that too, right? My job, my work, the thing I'm doing right now is the most important thing in the world. And it's not good. You're right, brother. And, we, and we, we start to look at people differently because of it, right? We look at our coworkers. We look at our boss. We look at our employees. We look at our family. We look at other people in the church, right? You're not doing enough. You're not doing the right thing. My thing is the most important thing in the world. And therefore, you're not living up to the standard that I feel like you should live up to. And we get consumed with this idea. And what it does is it turns our hearts into a heart of bitterness towards one another. We become prideful with the work that we do. We become consumed with this work. And the reason that God has given us spiritual gifts is to use them to glorify him, not us. See, we're not not called to use our gifts in order to make ourselves look better, feel better. It's to work in service towards one another. It's to lay down our lives and to serve other people. And Jesus desired for her to use this gift as well. Martha, if you just had the right approach to this. And God is likewise calling you to do the same. And so just as David mentioned in the video, we, I mean, we have a need in our kids' ministry. We have a need all over our building and, and everywhere. Parking lot, welcome desk, student ministry, tech team. We have needs here. And that's the beautiful thing is that we want to call you into a life of using those gifts to serve God, not to serve us or to serve a building, but to serve Jesus and his family, which you are part of. And so we talk about this in in what we call our mission partner workshops. So if you haven't gone through a mission partner workshop, um, we don't like to use the term membership here at Grace Point, mostly because membership implies that that. You, you, you bought into something that you get benefits out of, right? You now, you now are privileged to, to take benefit of all of the packages that we've put together for you to experience, but that's not what, what it means here. So we don't call it membership. What we call it is being a mission partner because we believe that that is the true heart and intent behind using our gifts to serve the local body. It's to be on mission so that you can see the gospel reach not only to those who walk through these doors, but then the rest of our city. And so as pastors, we wanna equip you and encourage you and empower you to use what God has already given you, to use it out to fulfill your purpose and to do so with the right heart and mind. And so Jesus gave his life for you and he has called you to become a son and daughter. And so what that means is that we don't use our gifts in order to earn God's favor, which I think sometimes it's easy to do, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come here so that I, that I can serve, that I can work. Even when we go to our work, we're going to have the right attitude. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to be you know, upstanding people so that we can make God like us more. Maybe we can earn God's favor. Maybe we can get something out of this when really you've already been given all of that, church. When Jesus died for you, he's invited you to become a son and a daughter. And so you have favor as a son and daughter. So when we work, when we serve, when we have a good attitude and and good character at work, we don't do so in order to get God's favor. We do that because of God's favor. We do that out of a response to the fact that God has already loved us. And so we just want to respond to that. We want to take part in that. And we want to serve others so that they may also know that love and that hope and that peace that we've already come to know. So we also work because we want to be good take care, uh, caretakers of what God has already given us, right? And in church lingo, we call this stewardship. So if you hear that word stewardship, it means just take good care of what's been given to you, right? And see, everything we have in life is a gift. The job that we have, our families, our house, our church, our people we surround ourselves with, those are all gifts that God has given us. And everything in life is an opportunity for us to reflect God's character 
in how we operate. It's a chance to draw near to God and to share him with others and even both. And we often struggle with the work that we're doing. And how many of you have ever had a job that you hate? Nobody. Oh, just three people. Okay, cool. I'm glad you've all lived the golden life, right? American dream. Congratulations. Well, let's just go home. Um, I've worked a lot of cruddy jobs, right? I've worked with uh, um, bosses that I dislike. Um, not that that's right now. I'm not saying that. This is a great place to work. David, if you're listening, I love you. Um, but we work at a lot of places that, that are hard to get through, right? I mean, just the daily grind. It's hard to just write that next TPS report, right? Or fill out that Excel sheet. Yeah, going old school there. <laughs> um, but we do things that are difficult. And I want to let you know that that's a blessing. That where you're at right now, God has given you as a gift. And it's your chance to reflect his heart and his character. And so we can walk into that job grumbling, complaining. But I'll tell you this, I had a friend who used to clean human feces off the uh, ceiling of a McDonald's bathroom. And so if you haven't experienced that, I would say uh, you got it pretty good. But even that we can have with the right character. And I think that's what, what God looks for. More than like how many hours we put in, how dedicated we are to this place. I think what God is asking us to do is to work with the right character. As he looks at Martha, Martha, man, if you could just do this with, with how I've asked you to do this, as service, as love, as not, not to look to, to get anything out of this, not to say how good I am or how important I am or to really even feel anything yourself, but to pour out to others and to have good character. And when we're being a good steward of these opportunities, then God's going to present opportunities for us to shine light into the darkness, right? To be a light in a dark place. And this is just all about being good stewards, of just taking advantage of every little moment that God gives us because nothing on this, this life, in this life, on this earth, is really ever guaranteed. It's all been given to us as a gift. Every beat of our heart right now, every time you breathe in air, that's a gift from God. When you show up to that place, you can show up with a bad attitude and you can grumble and complain all you want, or you can show up with the mind that, Hey, I'm going to do this for God. All things for his glory. Amen. All things. It's kind of like working out, right? So I bought a gym membership a few weeks ago. I haven't used it. Um, yeah, I did go one year where I did buy a club fitness membership for two years, and I did literally go one time. And I realized quickly this isn't for me, but I guess I still got to pay for it. Um, but I bought a gym membership, and I'm planning on going with Dwayne because if you've seen Dwayne, you know why. Um, I tried to arm wrestle him at the Super Bowl party, and it did not go well. Um, so that was eye-opening. But the reason I want to go to the gym isn't, isn't to look fit or to, to do anything, but it's because I got kids. I get young kids, man. And if I'm pounding sleeves of Oreos every day of my life, I need to have a counterbalance, right? I'm, I want to be a good steward of my body and what God has given me so that I can, therefore, be a good steward of all the other moments that he's given me in my life. And so likewise, when we, when we work, we want to do it with the same mind. See, the work Martha was doing was good, and it was pleasing to Jesus. The actual act of what she was doing was great. It was so good. And she was using her gifts to serve him, but her attitude changed, and it made it an idol. And she was consumed with it, and when her attitude shifted from worship to pride, it became simply just busyness. Just emptiness and busyness. And I feel like we consume our lives with that. John Nixdorf, one of our elders, says that we're constantly on the treadmill of busyness. That we just get on and we just do stuff just to be busy, just to get to the end of the day sometimes. And it never ceases. When we get one thing off our plate, we dump five more things on. And it's just this never-ending cycle of busyness. But Mary, on the other hand, we see, is sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to the words that he speaks. She's soaking in all of Jesus' teachings. And she's a picture of what it means to really rest and abide in Christ. And so our work has a counterpart called rest. And so work is a good thing when we do it in the right way. But we also need to take time to rest as well. And that's equally as good. And so for work to not become pride, it has to be balanced by rest. 
And for rest, likewise, to not be laziness, which it can, right? We're going to swing that pendulum. Some people will read this passage and say, that's my justification for sitting on my rear and doing nothing. And that's not what this passage is talking about. We can't just swing the pendulum back to the other way. But there's a balance here because rest without work is just simply laziness. And God calls us to work. He also calls us to rest. But Martha, because she had the wrong perspective on her work, she assumed that what Mary was doing was laziness. But Jesus corrects her. And Mary isn't being lazy. Instead, she's resting at the feet of Jesus. And when work becomes an idol, we get burnt out. And I don't know about you, but I've, I've, I've felt burnt out a lot of times in my life when I've, when I've made my work my one priority, my top priority, I've become burnt out. And the antidote to this exhaustion is rest, and rest is a gift from God, guys. God himself rested after he created everything to model this rest for us. Not because God needed it. God is infinite in everything, every attribute. And he doesn't need rest, but he did so in order to model this for you and for me. It says in Genesis 2, it says, On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day that he rested from all of his work of creation. So God made us to work, but he also made us to rest, to model this idea of rest. And this idea of rest, guys, is so serious to God that God doesn't suggest that we do this. God commands that we do this. In Exodus 20, it says, Remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant nor your animals nor any foreigner residing in your towns. It's all encompassing. It's everything. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. See, God takes rest, guys, very, very seriously. And it's kind of like this, right? If you've had young kids, you're going you're gonna to know what I'm talking about. It's like forcing your kid to nap, <laughs> right? So they're all up in their craziness all day long, and you need to go take like a couple hours of rest, not just for you, but also for me, man. I need a break from you too. I need you to go take a nap so that I can just chill out and mentally tune out for a few minutes, right? But we need them to rest because we know by five, six o'clock at night, boom, they're going to crash and they're going to get super cranky and they're going to start getting super angry. And then all of a sudden it's way worse, right? And so having six of them, I can tell you that this is a terrible situation to be in the missing of the nap. But likewise, we live our lives like we do, like our kids live theirs. We're so busy. We're so worried about doing all of the stuff that we we don't have time for a nap. I just can't do that. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to rest. I don't have time to take a break. Are you kidding me? I got so much to do. And then by five o'clock, man, we're cranky and we have no idea why. We're like, "I I don't get this. Why can't I just feel restful? And what happens is we, we kind of look at God's model and we says, God, that's good for you. You know what? Glad that you rested. I'm glad that you, you got to take a break, but you don't know my life, man. You don't know my story. You don't know what I'm doing right now. And the work that I'm doing is so important that I can't do what you did and take rest. You hear how arrogant that sounds? How prideful? Like we think that our nine to five is more important than the six days that God made everything that God can model rest, God can, can take a day off, right? But we can't, we don't have time for that. We become arrogant and prideful when we think that our work is more important than what the Lord does. And even if we don't think that it, at the time, that's what we reflect. That's what we're communicating with how we live our lives. And God, I want you to know this, God has given us rest. He modeled rest not because he needed it, He modeled rest because he made us to rest. And he wanted to show us by example of how to do that. God created you for rest. And the enemy, I know right now, what he likes to do is when we even try to rest, right? We're exhausted from trying to rest because the enemy comes in and is like, what are you doing? 
don't have time to sit on your butt. You don't have time to take a nap. You don't have time to take a day off. You need to get up. You need to keep going. You need to, you know, go back to work. You need to answer that email. You need to answer that text. You need to get up. The kids need something. You need to do this. Constant, constant, constant. Why? Because the enemy knows that an exhausted Christian is an ineffective Christian. And he wants you to be ineffective. He can't steal your salvation. So what he can do is he can steal everything that that surrounds. And he wants to. And so he's going to guilt you. He's going to condemn you. He's going to try to make you think that you're terrible for doing that. When in fact, it's the opposite of what God says. So who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the enemy? Or are we going to believe God, church? We need to believe the voice of God who says, rest. Take a moment. Take a day. It's required. And so I don't want to get into all the do's and don'ts of what a day off looks like, right? <laughs> so we're not going to get into that. But what I will say about rest is we're often confused even by what this is, and we do it in the wrong way. Rest isn't simply sitting on the couch and getting angry at a football game on a Sunday. <laughs> it is not restful for me, I will tell you that. Rest isn't simply just taking a nap for 20 minutes. Rest simply isn't doing your hobby for a day or going for a hike or, you know, whatever that looks like for you, right? Those are all good things. Those are all great things. Those can all be restful things too. But I think what true biblical rest is what's modeled here by what Mary's doing, sitting at the feet of Jesus, soaking in every word that he says. But we look at all these other things like, man, I got rest. I, I sat in front of the TV. How many of us really sit in front of the TV for several hours and feel good? Like, I usually feel like garbage after that. Like, it's not, it doesn't feel restful. But we look at these things, and it's kind of it's like this. So I, I've at least lived here for one summer in San Antonio. And it is hot. Um, I haven't experienced the fullness of the heat, I've been told. Um, but I'm, look, I'm not looking forward to that, no. Um, but imagine a typical July in San Antonio. It's what, 130 degrees, lots of humidity, right? And picture yourself out in the yard all day, mowing the grass or painting a fence. Um, I don't even know why it's used painting the fence. It's like Huckleberry Finn. Do people still paint fences now? I don't even know. I think they come pre-painted, I don't know. Um, but imagine you're outside just working all day in the heat, doing whatever you're gonna do, right? And, and you see a kiddie pool full of some lukewarm water and you jump in it and you splash around for a little while and you're like, ah, oh, that feels good. That feels great, yeah. And that's, that's like our, our rest. That's like our naps and our hobbies and sit in front of the TV all day. It's, it's kind of relief, but man, sitting at the feet of God is like jumping into an ocean. It's truly taking relief from the heat and the exhaustion. And church, man, sometimes we're so content with kiddie pools when we really have the opportunity to jump in an ocean at any point in time. And this is what God has in mind when he tells us a Sabbath. It's the deep, still waters of rest. And Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my leader. He's my guide. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. Man, he guides me along right paths and brings honor to his name. And I, and I really love the way the ESV puts it. And it puts it like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, I am content satisfied, filled. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And listen, he restores my soul. Man, church, when was the last time your soul was restored? Not just given a break, not just jumping in a kiddie pool, but restored back to what it was. See, Jesus is the green pastures. Jesus is the still waters that he's referring to here. He is our peace. He is our comfort. He is our rest. 
When we look at Matthew 11, Jesus just directly tells us this. He says, come to me. Church, come to me. Don't go to the other stuff. Don't go to the things that you think give you rest. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, I am lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Are we going to believe the words of Jesus? Come to him. Don't go to the other stuff. The other stuff is temporary. It's fleeting. It's a, a, a mirage of what's true. They're kiddie pools, and Jesus is the ocean. And church, we have access to that, to just jump in at any point that we need to. Jesus desires to give us rest, for he knows the pain and the brokenness that we experience. He knows the work. He knows the heaviness of our lives. And just as Mary sat at his feet and allowed him to fill her soul, likewise, we can come to him and he can give us rest. So don't rob yourself with kiddie pools, church, but dive into the deep end. And there's a practice in the Hebrew culture around Sabbath, around what it means to rest. And see, they recognized how, how vital this practice was for their lives. And so what they did is um, they built this into their calendar and they just didn't rest every seven days, but they rested every seven years. They would have a seven year Sabbath. And so on the Sabbath year, the land would rest they would let, let the land rest, so they'd store up up until then, and they'd let the land rest. They would forgive debts. And so they would ease the pain of life. But then the beautiful thing is they took it now another step further because they realized, man, this is good stuff. We can rest once a week. We can rest for a whole year, once every seven years. Let's do this again. Let's take it up a notch. Let's have what's called a jubilee year. So seven times seven, so every 49, 50 years, they would have a jubilee year. And what this means is if you were a slave, you were free. You were given freedom. If you had land taken away from you, it was given back to you. Everything was restored. Everything was redeemed. Everything was rested and put back to what it should be. And they called this the year of jubilee. And I think we need a year of jubilee, don't you? I feel like we're, we're at a point in time that we've been through so much stuff, right? That we need some time of Sabbath. We need some time of Jubilee. And I think it doesn't have to be every 49 years. I think because we have Jesus, we can have that daily. And so when we look at these moments in our lives, I think we need to look for Jubilee moments every day. To have Jubilee moments. And what this means of is, it's just taking a moment to pause in your busy work day, before you write that email, before you answer that question, just take a moment, give it to God. Say, God, I'm gonna give this to you. May you give me peace in this. May you give me rest in this. And then see what God does. Maybe it's on your way to work, just pulling over and looking at the sunrise. You're like, man, God, thank you. Thank you for giving me that, for me to see that, to see your beauty painted across the sky. God, thank you. Maybe it's looking at your spouse and maybe you've been fighting, but realizing, man, they're such a gift. God, thank you. I don't deserve them. God, but you have given them as a gift for me and may I likewise be a gift to them. It's finding moments to find God in everything that we do. And it's these little moments of jubilee, these, these little pauses in our life that can truly give us rest, that can be the still waters in the green pastures. And so as we close out today, I want to leave you with, with four ways that you can, you can rest and work. And this is how you work and this is how to rest. The first one is this, let our work be worship, not worship our work. And it's easy to do that. It's easy to worship our work, to worship our job, to worship how we serve the local body. It's easy to worship it, but instead let our work be worship to God. The second thing on how to work and rest is be a good steward of your work. 
Don't waste the opportunities that God has given you. He's placed you in a position and at a time to interact with others around you. And you can be dark or lightness in the dark. For lightness shines when the darkest, the darkest darkness, when the, it's at the, it's the darkest point. That's when the light shines the brightest. And you have an opportunity to do that. Don't waste a moment. Be a good steward of your family, of the little moments you have with your kids, with your spouse, with your other family members, with your friends, with your neighbors. Those are all moments that you can steward well. The third thing is this. Stop being satisfied with kiddie pools when you have an ocean. You don't need to be satisfied with lukewarm kiddie pools and you're at these little moments of seeming rest, but instead rest at the feet of Jesus. Abide in him, attach to him, pray to him, church, worship him. Listen to him, allow him to guide you to be a lamp under your feet. Come to him for he wants to give you rest. And the last one is find jubilee moments. Find moments in your day to find joy, to find peace, to find rest. Take a minute to pause. There's this, this really cool app by John Eldridge and it's called the one minute pause and it's available on all the app stores. But it's just an easy way for you to click it open. It's one minute and they just walk you through a prayer of giving everything to God to rest. One minute pause app, download it. It'll be so beneficial for your life. Do it daily when you wake up in the morning or before you walk into work. Give all things, consecrate all things to him. Find those moments of jubilee to just appreciate God's goodness in your life and find rest in that. So when God restores, our work won't be in vain. We'll perform the work that he set before us, but we'll do it with character. We'll do it as worship to him. We'll be good stewards of it. And there'll be a day where he calls us into an eternal rest, an eternal Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of our rest. It's what he claims himself as. He says it, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And he wants to give us rest. He wants to give us peace in our lives. And so church, find those moments of peace and rest in your life. Don't waste the moments of work and don't make work your worship, but worship God through how you work. So if you are hearing something like this for the first time and you are indeed exhausted and need rest and you want to come to Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. We believe Jesus can truly give you peace in your life and rest from the heaviness of this world. And so if you're listening to this for the first time and, and you want to receive Jesus and be invited into this Sabbath and into this rest, I'm going to pray and I'm just going to ask that you pray alongside with me there in your seat. Jesus, we thank you, God that your yoke is easy. God, that your burden is light. That God, you call us into rest. That you are the still waters that we so desperately need. God, you're the green pastures that can fill us. God, you're the one that can restore our soul. And Jesus, I've been running for too long and too hard and I need that rest. So Jesus, I receive you this morning as my savior. God, I submit my life to you. I'm here to give you everything in my life, the burdens, the anxieties, the worries, to give them to you and to receive your rest and your peace and your salvation in return. Jesus, thank you for that. I wanna make you the Lord and boss of my life. God, it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray, amen. And so, if this is your first time accepting Jesus, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything weird, come up on stage, give a speech or anything, but what, what I'd like you to do is raise your hand because we have people in, in, our, in our room that wanna come alongside you and pray with you and support you and cheer you on. And you just went from death to life and that's worth celebrating. So we wanna celebrate with you. So if that was you this morning, I'm just gonna ask that you put up your hand this morning. If you needed Jesus, his rest and you asked that for the first time. And so we thank you, God, for that. And so church, tonight is a great opportunity for you to rest. We have what's called overflow. It's a sweet time of worshiping God, of praying to him. If you've never been, I'm gonna strongly encourage you to come tonight. It's a great moment to pause. It's a great moment to rest and to just be at the feet of Jesus.
So let's pray. God, thank you for this morning, the opportunities you've given us. Thank you for just what it means to rest and to work and, and God for guiding us in both of those things. I pray that as we go the rest of this week, God, that you present moments of jubilee for us, that you present moments of deep rest, not kiddie pools, that God, we can worship you through how we work and we can be good stewards of every moment that you've given us. Jesus, we love you and we thank you and it's in your name we pray, amen. Church, man, we love you. I pray that you have a great day. And we'll see you next week at Grace Point.